welcoming you at our round table, which uh, is entitled, as you know, uh, the Blue Danube Borders, Transport Areas and Artistic Images. Uh, it is organized by the Institute of uh, Slavic Studies. Um, and it is uh, uh, a round table of our inter interdisciplinary Central European seminar, which we with Daria uh, run since uh, 2016. And here you may see the link uh, which uh, leads to its uh, uh, homepage at um, our Institute's site. Uh, you may have uh, the information there about uh, uh, most uh, interesting uh, events which we held and I try to show you. So this is our homepage and even uh, some of uh, people who are uh, now taking part as listeners and presenters were already our guests. You see uh, the presentation of Andash and you will see also our guest uh, Oksana Yikimenko was also somewhere. Yes, Oksana. And you all are welcome one day to come to us uh, uh, personally or uh, via um, Zoom and present results of your uh, research. Uh, then we go to uh, some historical um, nostalgic part. It's not the first time our institute addresses the issue of uh, uh, the Danube. Uh, oops. Comments. Uh, as you see, uh, in 2010, there was a thematical special issue on the Danube uh, in the uh, Russian historical journal Rodina, Homeland. And here you may see the contents. Uh, most of these uh, articles are available on internet in the um, Russian Science Citation Index database, but uh, if you as not registered uh, users uh, have no access to that, we can send you um, the uh, materials of uh, this uh, issue, which uh, might be interesting for you. Uh, we also in that uh, special issue, we're trying to combine political history with cultural studies, literature and economics. Uh, so after some 10 years, we decided we can address this issue more uh, in an international team. And we expect also very exciting results today. Um, we hope that uh, our discussion would be fruitful and uh, you would be inspired to uh, contribute uh, your papers uh, worked uh, out as articles, uh, which we would be glad to publish in our yearbook, Central European Studies, uh, you see here the cover of its uh, uh, second issue, and now we are uh, we, we have sent to the publisher our third issue, the article of Andras uh, Vorash is uh, in that um, um, uh, in that issue, and uh, now we're working on the issue four, and hopefully your presentations would be in the um, uh, issue five. Uh, it also has its uh, homepage, you may uh, visit it, you may have a look at our um, uh, editorial board and editorial council and uh, the requirements which we put to the uh, manuscripts. And if you are intended to submit us an article after today's discussion, please write it in your uh, native languages, we would translate it. So do not bother you with uh, uh, writing an uh, article in English if it's not your um, uh, mother tongue, so to say, so please write it in uh, Hungarian and German and Serbian, etc. We would be very glad to uh, to consider it for uh, publication. Uh, and uh, so uh, those who have learned about uh, our roundtable in the last minute and who are interested right now in what we are going to discuss, we can also suggest you to uh, go to the um, uh, site of our institute, and here you may, oh, why cannot I, moment, uh, here you can also see the um, abstracts of the papers which we are going to uh, discuss today, so this material is already online and you can uh, go to it today, go back to it tomorrow, and uh, all your reflections uh, could be uh, 
discussed in uh, correspondence after our uh, roundtable today. So that's our introductory remarks, and we are very glad to you know, give uh, to open the floor and ask our moderators of uh, our first part, uh, Andras and Mila, uh, start our first section. So please, we yes, that's it. Thank you very much. I'm not sure, Mila, if you are the first to speak, or shall I, or. Uh, I think it's it's good to introduce our first speaker or to, to make any preliminary remarks which you consider to be relevant right now. Uh, hello, everyone. I have a question. How many times uh, we have for the one report? We suggested 20 minutes. 20 uh, minutes? To talk, to talk and... Very precise questions uh, after and the discussion uh, after the first four presentations, maybe like that. Uh, after the all of uh, reports uh, of first part, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd like to thank the event planners and uh, I hope our, co uh, our today's uh, conversation uh, will be inspiring. Uh, so let's start with the first 10. Uh, I, um, um, for the first 10, uh, the Danube and uh, ecological axis of uh, Europe, please. Dr. Lajos Ratz, uh, the University of Seaget. Please, Lajos. Uh, thanks a lot. I try to join my uh, presentation. Okay, I hope uh, yes. you can see. It's oh. visible, yes. yes. Okay. Uh, uh, I think if uh, necessary to define my identity, uh, I am a, a climate historian and environmental historian. Uh, originally, I studied the history and geography. And uh, I would like to avoid any connection with the political life, therefore specialize to analyzing of uh, uh, historical events of the uh, uh, physical uh, environment. It's not easy to avoid the connection with the political life, but I try. Anyway, um, uh, environmental history is a, a quite new branch of uh, historical research founded in the middle of 70s. It's the youngest uh, branch of uh, its name sometimes uh, green history. Uh, the basic uh, uh, point of view of environmental history that between physical environment and society, there is interconnection. Not only is the society able to influence uh, a function uh, of the physical environment, but there are uh, influence backwards. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, make a, a short survey about interaction uh, of Danube and uh, a local society uh, from the point of view of environmental history, uh, from the point of view of interconnection. Look at the research question uh, of this uh, short presentation. The first one, how formed the river Danube, the basin of Danube? Uh, I will define a little bit later what means the basin of Danube, because this is the key uh, notion of uh, uh, historical analysis. The second one, how transformed the medieval, modern, and recent society, the river Danube? Of course, it's a very short presentation, but I try to show one case study, a short case study about uh, uh, these interconnections. Look at the first. If uh, we are looking at uh, trajectory of uh, River Danube, it's uh, uh, launch on the Black Forest and arrive uh, to the Black Sea. Uh, the trajectory of the Danube uh, is the second longest uh, river of Europe. Uh, and because I am geographer, I'm interested for the field trips. I traveled from the Black Forest with my geographer uh, friends to the Black Sea. Therefore, I had personal impression and personal uh, experiences about the uh, valley, about the uh, river of Danube. If we are looking at uh, profile of Danube, there is the upper, middle, and uh, uh, lower part of the Danube. Recently, because Hungary is a part of the middle, part of the Danube, I will focus in my case study, this part of Danube. Uh, okay, look at the closer law. Very interesting in the historical literature, using for the middle part of the Danube, two terms, basin of Danube versus Carpathian basin. Very interesting, historically. Before the 20th century, 
majority, majority of uh, historical author wrote Basin of Danube. Why? Because historically, much more important the axis of the country. And very interesting, the Carpathian Basin, as uh, scientific terms, appeared only at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, when, for political reasons, increased the importance of the boundary, outer boundary of the country. Therefore, historically, this is the basin of Danube, because historically, this is the axis of the country, formation of the country. Size of the uh, Carpathian Basin or versus, uh, Basin of Danube, uh, 300,000 square kilometers, more or less, because it's uh, a little bit uh, difficult to define the boundary more exactly. At the part of Danube, which uh, crossed over the uh, Carpathian Basin, uh, 805 uh, kilometers. Uh, basically, historically, if we are looking back to the Roman age of Roman Empire, the western part of, uh, uh, of Carpathian Basin named Pannonia. Uh, in this point of view, sometimes and somehow, the boundary of civilization in the evolution, historical evolution of the uh, macro region uh, is the Danube. Uh, and other parts on the Roman Empire named Barbaricus. It's very, very interesting how surveyed in the local identity. At, in my university, at my university, Second University, year by year, there is a football match uh, between two teams. One part named Barbaricum, I play in the Barbaricum team because it came from the eastern part of uh, Hungary, and other part, the western, uh, uh, named Pannonia. And if we are looking at this area, we can see this is a recent map. It's a multicultural, multinational area because this is a crossroads and boundary of Eastern and Western uh, Christendom. This is the boundary of different versions of the Protestant uh, Church, uh, uh, Calvinist, uh, Lutheranian, and any other. Okay, this is a crossroad in this point of view. If you are looking a little bit uh, metaphoric approach, uh, one of the most important old, uh, poets of Hungarian literature, Adi Andre, uh, defined uh, this area Hungary is a heavy country which was moving between the coast of East and the West. This very relevant uh, uh, metaphorical de description of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, political and social life of uh, Hungarian society, and uh, this term used until now in the uh, public uh, discussion. What means the ferry? Ferry, this is a device between uh, communication, transport, and travel between the coast of the uh, river. Uh, there is an evolution, of course, in the in the in the in the uh, uh, communication between the coast, uh, the second uh, uh, milestone, a construction of the uh, pontoon bridge, the first one, a Turkish empire for military reasons constructed the first pontoon bridge between Pest and Buda, and uh, a little bit later, after the Turkish wars, uh, constructed in the middle of 18th century and functioned until the. Uh, middle of the 19th century, uh, uh, pontoon bridge, and finally the first steady bridge uh, constructed, the chain bridge, recently in use. If somebody visited in uh, Budapest, uh, know well. Look at a historical example. First uh, case study: a Hungarian conquest. A Hungarian tribes uh, uh, for longer journey or shorter journey recently than the discuss. Uh, in the historian between the uh, among the historian of uh, early modern history, uh, started somewhere from Ural Mountain and reached a uh, Volga River, the old uh, Hungary, the Magna Hungaria, located the Volga River. Very interesting. From the largest uh, river of Europe, right to the second largest, into the Carpathian Basin, which is the most important ecological consequence of the. Uh, of uh, the conquest of the Carpathian Basin. Uh, if uh, uh, we are looking at uh, size of grazing land, which used the Hungarian tribe, it's a little bit less than one million per kilometer. When arrived to the Carpathian Basin, the territory much smaller. Only whole of the Carpathian Basin or Basin of Danube, 300,000 per kilometer. And only half of this area uh, usable 
for the grazing land is under 200 meters altitude. Moreover, large parts of the plain area temporarily or continuously under water cover, uh, under water uh, cover. Uh, how can adapt to this new homeland uh, Hungarian tribes? One of the most efficient forms of adaptation in the Hungarian literature, it's a very strange term named to meadow transhuman. Transhuman, this is the uh, grazing uh, system applied in the Alps, the high mountain. During the winter time, the cattle herd survived in the valley and go up to the higher parts of the mountain. In the plain area, no mountain, but there are three plants. Icy flood March, green flood in June and October for Mediterranean meteorological influence. If we are looking at the animation, a flood plain area under cover water and back and go and back. And a Hungarian tribes and the Hungarian uh, farmers uh, realize and shepherd realize it's usable for a, uh, a temporary grazing. Look at the model of meadow transhuman. If we are looking uh, uh, left black, uh, down uh, the map, uh, uh, there is a large circle, floodless area, a small empty circle, the place of settlement, and any other a flat plain, low flat plain area. And a Hungarian herds and flags, it go down, floodless period, go back, in the flood period. Therefore, the carrying capacity with help of metal transhumans increased uh, with help of uh, this, uh, uh, this agrarian this, uh, grazing system. Look at, uh, uh, see a closer look. This system is uh, uh, survived in the Middle Ages. It's renamed a flood plain uh, management system. This is a developed version of the metal transhuman. Uh, the first function of flood management. Why? Because in the Carpathian Basin, one of the most important problems, a water circle. A water circle. Uh, this uh, 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 flood, flood plain management system function, you can see uh, that uh, a small channel connected the bed of river with lake natural or artificial lake. On the time of rainy period, on the time of high precipitation, flew up the water and the other problem of the Carpathian Basin are uh, uh, drought, uh, shortage of precipitation, and on the dry period, used as device of irrigation. It's very clever uh, innovation role. Uh, and there is a picture, there, there is a, a picture about the system. You can see how connected to the bed of river, uh, a small channel, uh, uh, a lake connected to each other. And grazing land for sheep, pigs, and cattle. You can see this is a, a typical Hungarian plain beach feeding with uh, happy cows. It's very usable, very rich, fertile uh, part of the, of the plain area for grazing. Uh, very important, until the 19th century, this is the most important food garden of Hungary. And finally, a mosaic landscape management very increased, improved the flood uh, secu uh, food security. Good. Look at the Little Ice Age. Little Ice Age started somewhere the late century of the Middle Ages. Why so important? Because if we are looking at the Little Ice Age, it's a cold period, the last closed climate epoch of uh, climate history. Uh, why so important? Look at, for example, a uh, uh, reconstruction which made in Greenland uh, take the same paw from the uh, ice cover. If we, are we may realize that the Little Ice Age, which closed only in the 19th century, was the coldest period all of the human history in the last 10,000 years. Okay, uh, the most important uh, regional security of the Little Ice Age in the Carpathian Basin was increase the quantity of precipitation. This diagram shows how changed the 
quantity of precipitation between the beginning of 16th and the middle of 19th century. Uh, on that time, for example, somebody who visited in Hungary, probably visited on the coast of uh, Lake Balaton, the water level of Lake Balaton in the 17th century, which was the high, the coldest period in global level of uh, this life age and the uh, highest uh, uh, level of precipitation because this is the region of activity, the highest level with more meters higher uh, uh, to recent level. Uh, therefore, not by chance that water regulation on the modern time became the synonym of modernization in Hungary. If somebody speaking in the early modern time, modern time about the how necessary to modernize the country, the first idea, water regulation. Uh, not by chance. Look at the uh, typical flood of uh, uh, typical disaster, natural disaster of the little ice age. Uh, one of the most uh, devastating natural disaster happened uh, in the first half of uh, 19th century, more exactly uh, 13, uh, between 13, 18 March, uh, 1838. Uh, uh, it happened on Pesh uh, uh, Buddha, recently named Budapest. Uh, one part of Vida, uh, if somebody visited this obvious, uh, uh, area, other, other, it's uh, 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 part of the Hungarian plain. Uh, this flood is a typical icy flood of the Danube uh, and, uh, uh, and destroyed all, almost whole of the, whole of the city. If we are looking at some picture, of, uh, some paintings uh, from, the, uh, from the time, contemporary paintings, and uh, this map show well Pesh area, the plain area, uh, took under water and the depth of the water two, two and three meters. And look at the uh, damage. Uh, this is a two map about the uh, size of the Danube, how changed uh, on the time of the flood. Number of victims, 153, uh, uh, destroyed buildings, 2,281, uh, heavily damaged buildings, 827 and slightly damaged uh, uh, buildings, uh, 1,146. Uh, 1, uh, uh, Why so interesting? Because it uh, show one uh, typical uh, terms and typical mechanism of, uh, of uh, economy and history of economy. It's named um, creative destruction. Sometimes the disaster opened the way a new for new paradigm. Not by chance, the second half of 19th century, the key project, whole of the, each uh, government, a voter regulation, voter regulation and channelization, uh, a channelization of Danube and channelization of uh, Pisa River. Uh, majority of works is handwork, make with handwork, some paintings about the uh, period of the uh, last third of the 19th century, and this is the channel. It's very moderate flat plain, and the majority of water, water body falls inside to the uh, dam. And very interesting pictures, how changed the landscape, how formed the anthroposphere, how transformed a natural environment to artificial environment. And the last example, not uh, by chance, partly for consequence of uh, uh, water regulation and transformation of the physical environment appeared environmental movements in Hungary. Uh, but uh, there is a special taste because it's partly uh, political organization role. Uh, in Hungary, everybody know uh, the name of Gacikovo Nagymaros Dam. It's the Birsh Nagymaros, it's uh, more popular because it's uh, um, uh, best known in the Hungarian uh, journals and literature. It's a uh, water regulation project, late water reg regulation project of uh, Danube, some map about the uh, ideal uh, form of, of water regulation. The peace treaty, uh, the, the treaty of uh, this uh, water regulation project signed even uh, in the uh, uh, 1977 in Budapest, in Budapest treaty, uh, picture about this, and very similar project unfolded uh, and launched in Romania, systema systematization uh, of uh, rural area. And the 
rural people moved to the uh, large uh, modern socialist city and the place of the uh, small rural villages transformed to, for example, uh, electric power station and some picture about uh, a small uh, city. And uh, this area mainly lived in Hungarian minorities. Therefore, it's the Hungarian uh, community very, uh, uh, very sensible for this project. Look at the consequences. From the most important Hungarian uh, uh, environmental movement named Danube Circle, Dunakör Hungarian name, uh, founded 1984. Uh, early picture about the formation, basically formed uh, uh, intellectuals, uh, 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 journals, uh, uh, journal makers, and uh, authors, uh, and uh, uh, scholars. It's a very large, uh, large organization, and uh, formed, for example, Life of, uh, Life of Ring, it's a quite typical device of uh, uh, environmental movement, and organized the first public demonstration with uh, uh, 10,000 followers. It's the, it's the uh, uh, largest uh, public demonstration after the Hungarian Revolution. And, uh, and close to the first democratic election. And because I have only 40 minutes, turn to the conclusion. The first conclusion, the Danube is active historical actor of ecosystem of its catchment area. It's obviously to my mind. Uh, secondly, Channelization of river increased by the vulnerability of the Danube and society too. At the time of climate changes, there is a great balancing power of Danube. And finally, the Danube can internationalize the local community. I comment only with uh, one, uh, uh, one sentence, uh, this uh, uh, conclusion. I traveled from Germany, from the Black Forest to Black Sea, Romania, and very interesting there is a lingua franca in the port, uh, in the harbors. Uh, former time German and recently German mixed with English. Okay. I suggest to you travel on the board of, uh, on the, on the, on the uh, coast of Danube. It's very interesting and very, uh, 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 very interesting and, uh, and, uh, and uh, some part undiscovered uh, part of Europe. Okay, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, Lajos. Uh, we were just about to warn you that your time was up, but uh, you came to the conclusion right when we wanted to stop you anyway, so there was no need to ask you to uh, briefly sum up. I suggest that uh, if there is any immediate question uh, directed to Lajos, uh, then please uh, either use the chat or um, raise your hands uh, so that we can see that you would like to ask something. Um, and of course, there will be an opportunity at the end of um, the session as well to ask questions. If at the moment there is, I don't see anyone, but please let me know if it's just me who can I can ask a question for myself. <laughs> that's, that's also a possibility, but uh, then let me uh, have a very brief question. You mentioned this floodplain economy, and um, I'm always curious how much this system that you described to have been important in mitigating floods and using the water surplus as well as to deal with drafts, um, how much it is a specificity uh, or how much actually similar systems were working actually all throughout Europe, and if... Um, if it's not a specificity, whether we can trace the learning process of it. So how actually this knowledge has been acquired by Hungarian society um, in the Middle Ages or in the modern times, whether that makes sense. Yeah, but uh, um, uh, a Hungarian plain is a very special area because uh, uh, in the environmental history and the archaeologists uh, defined the last bay of great, uh, uh, great uh, plain area, started from China and uh, closed uh, uh, into the Carpathian Basin. And, uh, and uh, uh, on the time of water regulation, uh, uh, as a model of water regulation, used the uh, Valley of Po, Po, this is an uh, Italian uh, uh, river. Everybody knows it's northern part of, uh, 
more than part of Italy. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, one engineer came from Italy named Paleo Kappa, probably uh, the Hungarian, uh, Hungarian uh, scholar know his name, uh, revised the Hungarian voter regulation. And uh, according to Paleo Kappa, it's uh, uh, too uh, over, 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 over planned. The Hungarian version was over planned. Uh, and uh, why? Because uh, uh, the voter regulation financed uh, with help of governmental subvention. You know, probably this, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, argument. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, because everybody who applied uh, our, our landlords who applied the voter regulation received a governmental subvention. Therefore, everywhere applied these devices. Therefore, the most important project of the Hungarian voter regulation somehow re-transformation of, uh, of voter regulation. Um, this is one, one project, uh, but unfortunately, this is uh, it's very expensive and a lot of interest, uh, counter interest. Uh, uh, it's, it's a great barrier for we, because uh, a lot of places which uh, in normal cases under voter recently is a place of, uh, of different buildings. For example, the most uh, famous event was in the case of the Mishkots, probably you know, uh, founded a, a shopping center. <laughs> under voter and the time by time the vote the, the river is visiting in the in the in the shopping center <laughs> and everybody surprised why because it's a place of the voter but uh, to my mind uh, to my opinion uh, i am very pessimistic i am very pessimistic in this case because the lobby force everywhere recently uh, pandemia or 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 uh, climate change or any other uh, other, counter any other reason, the, the lobby force of the environmentalists, to my impression, decreased. It's a good example of a Hungarian environmental movie, or this is the same case in the Russian environmental movie, because uh, some years ago I read the uh, environmental history of, uh, of Russia, and a very interesting story that before the political change, everybody and a large community participated of, uh, of uh, different environmental movies. And after the political change, almost all expired. Therefore, uh, it's necessary to re-transform, re-widen of, uh, of the plain area because it's very fragile. Uh, it causes some, but to my mind, it's very moderate results are in this direction. And uh, in Europe, it's very wrong good example of, uh, of uh, rehabilitation. Thank you um, very much. I suggest that we move on so that we would uh, not run out of time more than we already did. So uh, I will invite Mila to uh, present the next speaker if that is fine with you and then I will lead the discussion. At um, the end. Thank you, Andres. Uh, let me introduce our next, next speaker. Uh, it's uh, Luminita Gatajel from uh, Leibniz Institute for East and uh, South uh, East European Studies from Regensburg. And her report, uh, Engineering the River, Technology along the Lower Danube in the 19th century. Please, Luminita. Thank you so much. Uh, I changed a bit because I want to focus more on just one case study for this 20 uh, minutes. Um, I, don't, I don't seem to know how to make it like, uh, a, okay, it worked. So this is part of a, a bigger project, a, a book project, where I focus on the Iron Gates and on the Delta. And uh, I, I look in the 19th century and I look at the uh, connection between engineering and international uh, cooperation. And today, as I said, I will focus on the Delta uh, and, and just present with more details, just a tiny uh, uh, step in this larger uh, projects of regulating the uh, lower Danube. So river engineering uh, projects are complex undertakings 
that need extensive planning, diverse knowledge and resources. This explains why these operations sometimes lasted for centuries and relied on political stability and a strong commitment from the state. So state officials found an interest in such a vast project because it enabled them to expand and consolidate state power. Chandra Mujerki, uh, who describes the building of the Canal du Midi, linking the Atlantic and then the Mediterranean in the 17th century, calls it an act of political will to extend the rule of the French king over a remote and unruly territory. And Mark Sayak, focusing on the transformation of the Rhine in the 19th century, claims that river engineering and nation building are inextricably interwoven. At all these cases, river infrastructures are built by engineers in the name of states within national borders. But what I want to focus today is on a river regulation project that was organized by an international organization, and that is the European Commission of the Danube. That was one of the first international organizations that, was, uh, that came together after the Crimean War. And it had seven members, namely the representatives of the great powers. So this study starts from the premises that the uh, building of infrastructure was a negotiated and often contested historical process in which different actors voiced different views and pursued different interests. Or as Sarah Pritchard put it, to present extens exclusively the path taken by a certain technological development creates a sense of inevitability, namely that uh, that's the only possible representation of, of the past. Indeed, the way a certain technology was implemented was not always the result of rational choices. Thus, this piece traces several alternative visions for the uh, completion of the first regulation project at the mouth of the Danube. And because the European Danube Commission united representatives of seven sovereign states, this process was even more disputed and lengthy than the usual process of decision making. And what I'm interested in is, is first of all, uh, on, on the limits, but also on the possibilities of international corporations and also in the process of how coalitions of interest uh, emerged uh, in this process. Another component that is important to me is that of engineering knowledge that was used to influence this decision-making process. So uh, when the European Danube Commission took over the Danube Delta after the Crimean War, its main task was to ensure safe navigation conditions from the river to the Black Sea. A major problem was the sand accumulation at the bar that threatened to stop the shipping traffic. In order to address this issue, members of the commissions knew little about hydrological works, invited several engineering uh, experts to assess the situation. And uh, these engineers that came to work in this contested area that in previous decades had been devastated by repeated military confrontations between Russia, uh, the Ottoman Empire and the Habsburg Empire, uh, but also in general, as David Bix, who researched the Mekong area, highlights that usually engineers that worked in this uh, volatile military and environmental conditions had little control over their projects. So uh, these projects suffered many setbacks and quite often they failed. So, uh, but this is a part of my, my larger argument, namely that uh, something what I call perpetual uncertainty influenced the way this regulation project uh, moved uh, forward. And it's not only that these projects were threatened by political instability, but they were also threatened by nature themselves, by storms, but also by unpredictable uh, sand movements uh, at the bar. So maybe 
uh, just uh, to to remind those who knows knows them, but also uh, to introduce those who are not quite familiar with the Danube Delta. That's uh, one of the first maps, uh, uh, detailed maps that exist uh, on the Danube Delta. Uh, important for this story is that the uh, Danube, uh, even today, but also at that time, uh, parted into three branches. But only the middle branches, the branch of Sulina, was the only navigable at that time. And then uh, uh, the thing that I was, uh, uh, I'm, I'm interested is, is the mouth of the Danube, the confluence between the river and, and the sea, and also the sand accumulations that made the, the level uh, of the sea to decrease. And uh, it made it hard for ships to cross from the river to the sea. So uh, the seven commissioners that met uh, in Galatz but were dealing mainly uh, in the first year with the Surina mouth, uh, only one of them, the British uh, uh, commissioner, was an engineer. All the others were mainly diplomats or generals, uh, things like this. Besides that, the commission itself had a chief engineer who was again a British uh, uh, subject called Charles Hartley. And uh, uh, the next few years of the commission, uh, the main issue that we're interested in is to choose a regulation project that would uh, deepen uh, the water level uh, at Sulina. For this, they made out an international call and they received several uh, projects. Uh, the most famous ones would be from an, uh, uh, Prussian engineers called Nobilink and this Charles Hartley. Uh, so uh, during the first year of his existence, European Danube Commission uh, debated which of the two projects uh, they would choose. I will spare you the, the, the technical detail, but the uh, uh, issue uh, at stake was the following, that the, la, the third branch of the Danube, the St. George uh, branch of the Danube, was the bigger one and the, that was at that time not used. But in order to regulate uh, this, this bigger and larger branch of the Danube, uh, it would take up to 10 years, it was uh, uh, said. And it also would have been significantly more uh, expensive. This is the proposal that the Prussian engineers, Nobiling, was uh, putting forward. Hartley, the, the chief engineer of the commissions, agreed with him, but said the commission lacks money. So let's just have a pragmatic solutions. Let's improve the Sulina branch. Uh, it's probably not uh, uh, such a spectacular project, but it will uh, be achieved uh, uh, within a shorter period of time. And uh, over the next few months, the commission uh, debated which of the two uh, projects to choose. And what I try to do uh, uh, and, and look in my research is not only on these technical details, uh, but I would argue that also cultural bias was important uh, for uh, choosing a project or dismissing a project. And uh, this cultural bias, or I would even say animosity, was between the uh, Prussian uh, commissioner and the British uh, commissioner who personally dis disliked each other, but also they were trying to push their own engineers uh, to be the one uh, responsible uh, in the end. And uh, um, um, the English were basically arguing, uh, he, the Prussian engineer just came for a few days and he makes a project and he is lacking all the uh, important details and the long-term perspective. Uh, and of course, the British engineer who is there uh, on a daily basis, he should be the one who, who should be in charge of, uh, of a project. Uh, uh, what the British are not saying is that uh, Nobiling, the Prussian, had, had a long career on the Rhine, and, and this expertise is, is simply forgotten just because he uh, only was there for uh, a few times. It's... Uh, um, uh, in the end, the commission is split. Half of the uh, members side with one project and half of the other members side with, a, with the other uh, projects. And nobody knows how to get out of this uh, situation. 
So they decide on a very pragmatic solution, namely to ask uh, the same Charles Hartley, who was uh, hired by the commission, to have a very small provisional regulation project that dealt uh, uh, with, very redu uh, with very little money, just to have a small relief for the Sulina uh, mouth until uh, the, the commission would decide for good what would be a, a long lasting uh, solution. So he put forward a very small uh, uh, project, uh, hardly this provisional project. And just to give you uh, uh, maybe a term of comparison, uh, the two original projects, we're talking about millions here of, of Ducats, but he uh, put forward with something like 100,000 and the commission halved this sum. So it was really very, very tiny. It said, okay, you do this and then we'll see uh, what, what is possible in the long term. Um, maybe here, uh, I would just, this is the finished project of, of Charles Hartley. So I would uh, spare you the uh, suspense and say that he was quite successful with this. So what he envisioned is the building of two piers to, to levies uh, from uh, uh, the mouth of the Danube into the sea and, and with this prolonging of, uh, of the shores to achieve uh, a, a, high, uh, a higher depth. But what is interesting in all these uh, uh, technical assessments and, and in, his, in the work of, of Charles Hartley is, is, is for me especially his, I would say, engineering philosophy. Because uh, uh, it's a bit counterintuitive, and it was for me when I was studying the sources, is that he did not believe, Charles Hartley, that man-made constructions can be permanent. He said that the art of man is powerless against the never ceasing operations of nature. To abate the evil, not to destroy it, is all one can hope to achieve. So he says that he can uh, uh, you know, provide a cure, the way he, he, he framed it, for the Su Sulina mouse, but only maybe for five years. Then another engineer or even himself have to improve and, and react to what the river uh, has done. So everything he promised the commission and uh, to the public opinion was a temporary fix of this uh, Sulina uh, uh, mouth. And also he was very well aware because he has been living there for maybe one year when he started with this project, is he was very uh, aware of the volatile conditions he had to operate. And it were not only the detentions and the military conflicts inside the European Commission, but also that uh, uh, the, the borders and the poor transportation uh, infrastructures delayed the arrival of construction materials, that there were not enough workers, especially not enough uh, qualified uh, workers. Uh, money was a constant problem. Uh, the, the commission, the only budget it had was to tax ships crossing from the river to the sea. And, but when traffic was delayed, then also the revenues of the commission were very small. So it relied on uh, loans from the Ottoman Empire. Everybody knows the Ottoman Empire didn't have much money at that time. So uh, Hartley was very much aware of this, this very volatile, very uncertain conditions in which he uh, operated. And uh, what he was also very much aware is that uncertainty also came from the river and the sea uh, themselves. So numerous torrents and storms interrupted the work for many days in a row. The unfinished piers were constantly submerged by water and part of their footing swept away. And of course, during winter, they couldn't work and ice deposits around the unfinished dikes threatened to break them. So what uh, uh, the solution he found in this context is uh, although he tried to, to build his piers with concrete and with stones, he in the end decides to use much more wood and timber. And this is just maybe a, a detail but it's, for me, it's, it's a decisive uh, a detail 
because the way he talks about it, he, he, he very much talks about the agency and the doings of the river. And he says, timber is the perfect material in this condition because it is hard enough to keep water inside, but it's also pliable enough and flexible enough to uh, you know, bend with a storm, but not break. And also it is much more easier to replace wood than it would be in case of stones. So uh, uh, actually he uh, tries and succeeds to find a specific solution for this very specific uh, situation and work with the river towards achieving his goals and not against the rivers. And, and when you look at the literature on engineering uh, uh, from that uh, period of time, uh, usually people talk, uh, in, and also historians, talk about force and you know taming rivers. And in part, it is true what, what hardly attempted and succeeded at the mouth of the Danube. But I would say that's only part of the story. I, I think he was much more flexible, much more you know, uh, uh, knowing, and uh, had a different kind of a knowledge that he brought from his training but he, he acquired knowledge locally and, and he tried, you know, all this abstract That's knowledge. Cool. Maybe you have only three minutes. Exactly, I, I'm at our last page. So, uh, so to, to really adapt it to this very, very specific uh, uh, situation. So uh, uh, to, to sum up is that he succeeded to prolong the spears, but uh, not uh, against the river, but but following and also, uh, you know, in a way complementing uh, uh, the river. And because it was such a success in 61, he finished uh, his constructions, nobody ever mentioned St. Uh, uh, George again and, and all the other alternatives uh, methods. And uh, uh, this is just, you know, a very short time frame I present, but it is part of a bigger story and, and here the last thing that I, I wanted to show you because it was such a success uh, it, it somehow it brought into uh, uh, motion something also other historians but also myself call iner inertia so it, so with this little success it it uh, gave you know pause and and uh, steam so more and more uh, significant these are all uh, uh, projects that will follow that aimed at straightening the Sulina uh, uh, arm. So even if this was probably not the best arm from the, from the tree to choose in the end, because such a tiny uh, project was successful, in the end, it determined the course of engineering uh, uh, action uh, for maybe the next 100 years. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation and uh, also for keeping the time very precisely. Uh, if there are immediate questions, this is the, uh, if I see correctly, Adit Kirai raised her hand. Uh, yes, uh, I liked it very much the way you explained that. and. Uh, um, but I was curious because you started with, uh, with this concept of this, this framing that um, uh, transforming a river is usually something that's maybe uh, that is a national project. But um, and I wanted to ask because after all, you came to a conclusion that it is not a national project. In that case, it wasn't a national project. Maybe it became later. Yeah. Um, that uh, David Blackburn says uh, he has a book, A Conquest of Nature, and he uses also this uh, image of the tamer of the, of the, of the Rhine, that is uh, Tula, etc. So exactly this kind of military vocabulary that was adapted on the, on the, uh, on the nature. And he, um, but he doesn't say it's something national. He always says it's something that is connected with wars. It is preparing war. In that case, perhaps it is continuing a war. But uh, I don't think why should why should we um, narrow this uh, the frame 
to national to to the nation. It can be also uh, the goal of an empire. And to my mind, obviously, the mouth of the Danube was always something that was an imperial question. That was uh, a matter of uh, fight between the great powers. Yes, sure. I mean, I was arguing against this this literature. Uh, so uh, there is a point here because quite a few projects in the 18th and 19th century, maybe not national in in in, in the sense they were aiming at centralization of state. Sure, but but uh, the mouth of the Danube is 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 complete uh, uh, at a complete opposite. You know, you you have a, a, a this international organization and and that tries to in the way i think ultimately it's, it's the reverse process so you have an international organization that tries you know to take up responsibilities of a state and of course this is not a state in the in the national state but it is very much imperial but it is also very much you know uh, cooperative i mean it it seems very so that that the british uh, you know at least in the first years they were the one pushing from it but but still it is very much a, co a cooperative moment there and uh, uh, and i think that's that's the that's the interesting thing to do and i try to do is trace how uh, at various stages a, a consent came together not only among the political representatives but also among uh, 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 the the experts and and political representatives. So it's a it's a it's a process on on several levels, uh, and this is just the starting point. What what I presented here. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, if there is no immediate question, then uh, I think we can move on so that we can leave some time for the end of this session. Uh, our next speaker with a again be introduced by me life that is fine um, with you and now i give the uh, i give the floor uh, to dela bordenda from institute of strategic uh, research university of defense of the ministry of the defense of republic of serbia belgrade and uh, his report uh, the danube as a significant communication line and strategic uh, barrier for serbia uh, yugoslavia in the first half of the 20th uh, century. Please, Delibor. Hello, everybody. Do you hear me? Yes. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you to the organizers for a kind invitation, of course, and have to apologize because I didn't prepare the PowerPoint presentation. So I hope my paper won't be uh, boring for you. Uh, so let me start. At the beginning of 20th century, the Danube, together with Sava River, formed the northern border of Serbia with Austria-Hungary. Serbia controlled some 325 kilometers of the Danube, from which it shared some 255 kilometers with Austria-Hungary from Belgrade to Tekia, and some 70 kilometers with Romania from Tekia to Radujevac. After the First World War had ended, the newly established kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes controlled 588 kilometers of the Danube, which flowed through its territory from the border with Hungary to the border with Romania and Bulgaria. During the first half of the 20th century, the Danube had two significant benefits for Serbia and Yugoslavia. First of all, it was a first-class international communication line of great importance for the national economy, especially for the Kingdom of Serbia that had no direct access to the sea. Secondly, it played the role of strategic barrier during the wartime. Although Serbia was a member of the European Commission of the Danube since its formation, firstly as an Ottoman tributary principality and afterwards as an independent state since 1878, Serbs did not manage to develop their own commercial fleet and utilize all the economic benefits of Serbia's position on the Danube almost until the end of the 19th century. The main competitors that hindered the development of the Serbian fleet 
where powerful Austrian First Danube Steamboat Shipping Company and since 1896, Hungarian MFTR shipping company with more than 200 steamboat ships and about 1,000 cargo tubs. Things started to change during the 1890s. After construction of the first railroads during the 1880s, Serbian elite became more aware of the welfare that well-developed transportation infrastructure could bring. Thanks to the acts of Serbian National Assembly from April 1890 and the privileges given for the foundation of the Serbian shipping company, it started to work three years later on October 1st, 1893. The opening of SIP Canal in uh, 1896 that made the navig navigation through the most dangerous sections of the Iron Gates gorge safer and easier, also accelerated the development of the river transportation in Serbia. During the next 20 years, Serbian shipping company was developing slowly. At the out outbreak of the First World War, it had on the disposal six passenger steamboat ships, six push tags, and 57 uh, barges with total engine power of 4,000 880 HP and a carrying capacity of 27,380 tons. At that time, Kingdom of Serbia owned 3.66% of total engine power and 1.86% of total tonnage of whole Danubian shipping transport capacities. The value of Danube for Serbia started to grow, especially at the beginning of the 20th century, namely from 1906 to 1911 Serbia, which was treated in a foreign trade almost as, an, as a colony of dual monarchy, led a struggle for economic independence from Austria-Hungary, so-called Pig's War. Until that moment, when the ban on the import of products from Serbia was introduced, the dual monarchy was the main Serbian trade partner consuming more than 85% of Serbian goods. The Danube waterway played an important role in Serbia's attempt to find new markets and maintain economic stability. In that period, Serbian goods were exported mostly via the Danube trade route in two directions, toward the Black Sea to Sulina and Germany, Regensburg. As a result of these, Germany became the main trade partner of Serbia instead of the dual monarchy accepting more than 40% of the Serbian exports, and Serbia won the battle for economic independence. Although the capacities of the Serbian shipping company's fleet were not sufficient, they played a significant role in, the, in that struggle. The importance of the Danube in strategic sense came to the fore, especially at the beginning of World War I. The river presented a powerful barrier for attackers, having in mind that large human, technical, and organizational capacities were needed to cross it. The attacker had to uh, have far-reaching preparations, allowing the defender the much-needed time to bluster his defense. In fact, the World War I started on the Danube on the evening of July 28, 1914, with the blazing fire from the Austro-Hungarian Danube flotilla monitors towards Serbian capital Belgrade, which caused enormous damage to the city. During the first months of the war, the Austrian Danube flotilla proved to be very effective in bombing settlements and positions on the Serbian bank of the river, as well as destroying its na uh, navigable objects. At that period, the Danube as a waterway was used for supplying Serbian army with the necessary armament, ammunition, and other types of war materials from Russia. In accordance with uh, that purpose, the special Danube expedition, headed by naval captain M. M. Vesjolkin, uh, was formed in September 1914. They sailed from the Russian Danubian port Reni to Serbian port Prahovo. Thanks to Russian help, which came in October and November 1914, Serbian army managed to stop the Austro-Hungarian invasion 
and clear national territory of the enemy troops. After that, in order to prevent the efficiency of Austrian flotilla and to protect the lower Danube as a communication line for Serbian and Russian navigation, at the end of 1914 and at the beginning of 1915, the Allies sent to Serbia heavy coastal artillery batteries and Navy sapper detachment. Thanks to their activities, the navigation on the lower uh, Danube was safe for Allied shipping until the fall of Serbia in Ottoman 1915. At the end of 1914, the Danube became very important supplying line for Russia as well, because of the fact that the Ottoman Empire entered the war on the side of the central powers. Consequently, the Turkish Straits, as a maritime waterway toward the Russia, were closed for Allied shipping. From then on, the Allies started to use Serbian territory and the Danube communication line for the so-called secret deliveries of weapons and military equipment from France and England to Russia. The shipments were made under the, the geese of Serbian goods, thanks to the fact that Serbia possessed a free zone in Thessalonica port. These shipments included the most important components for the needs of the Russian military industry, such as automobile and aircraft engines, airplanes, motor cars and spare parts, spare parts, reflectors, binoculars, optics, radio telegraph equipment, etc. The goods were transported by French steamships to the formerly neutral port of Thessalonica and then carried by the rail to Parachin in Serbia. From Parachin to Zaychar, the goods were transported by narrow uh, gauge uh, railway and the lorries and from there by normal gauge railway to the Danube port of Prahovo. From there, the goods were carried by the steamers and barges of Vesjolkin's special Danube expedition to Reni. On the other hand, some 45 convoys of war materials containing artillery weapons, pontoon bridges, telephone material, ammunition, rifles, gasoline, gasoline and alcohol, were sent from Russia to Serbia during 1915. The Danube was also important for central powers for supplying Turkey and later Bulgaria, what was the main reason, the reason for uh, launching joint Austro-Hungarian, German and Bulgarian campaign against Serbia in October 1915. During that campaign, Germans crossed the Danube on their part of front line between town of Smederevo and Ram but uh, uh, became at that moment the greatest amphibious operation in whole war history. To support a crossing of the Danube by their 11th army near Belgrade, the Germans used even big Berta 42 centimeter siege howitzer battery. Firing began on 6th October at, and the attackers crossed the next day to, to take the Serbian capital city. After the First World War, the newly established Yugoslav Kingdom became the knot of the whole Danubian navigation system. Yugoslavia controlled 22.5% of Danube waterway and some 37.5% of whole waterways in the Danubian Basin. On its territory were settled some of the most important installations such as SIP channel, SIP canal, that allowed the passage through Iron Gate sector. Thanks to war uh, reparations, the state obtained the largest commercial fleet on the Danube. According to the final distribution of ex-Austrian-Hungarian commercial fleet, Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes got 97 river boats with engine power of 27,235 HP and 806 barges and tankers with carrying capacity of 354,428 tons. Yugoslavs also obtained four monitors from former Austro-Hungarian Danubian flotilla. Thanks to these facts, during the interwar period, more than 40% of Yugoslav goods were exported via the Danube and main Yugoslav ports on the Danube were more developed than those on the Adriatic coast. According to the data of International Danube Commission from 1936, Yugoslavia had on disposal 1,109 vessels, 
but presented 32.17% of whole fleet on the Danube that numbered 3,448 vessels. In the late 1930s, the Danube also played an important role in supplying Nazi Germany with raw materials from the Balkans, in a particular with oil from Romania. The strategic importance of the Danubian Basin was also enhanced by plans to connect it to the North Sea and Adriatic and Atlantic Ocean by construction of Rhine Main Danube Channel, Canal and to the Baltic Sea uh, via the Danube Odra Canal. On the eve of World War II, the Danube as a waterway and Iron Gates Gorge particularly became uh, scenes of intelligence struggle between both sides in conflict. The British intelligence service made plans for sabotage actions with the aim at the preventing German nav navigation through Iron Gates Gorge sector. According to the plan, there were three poss possible ways of action. The first one involved the purchase of ships that sailed under the German flag in order to weaken the German merchant fleet. The second one was to bribe crews on Danubian vessels and to invite Iron Gates pilots on extended holidays with, with pay. The third most radical way included diversions with the explosive on the steep banks of Iron Gates Gorge. From 1939 on, there were many attempts by the Allies to disable this river passage, but they uh, brought no results. During late 1939 and early 1940, new plans were developed by the French general Maxim Weygand in uh, concert with the Yugoslav, Romanian, Greek, and Turkish general staff on opening the Balkan front against the Germans on the Danube. This plan uh, fell through after the fall of France in May and June 1940. The, signif the significant value of the Danube for the Axis was seen in April 1941, when the Germans actually began the invasion of Yugoslavia. On the night of 5th April 1941, they captured the Yugoslav army company guarding the SIP uh, uh, canal, the most important of seven canals uh, cut through the Iron Gates Gorge. After the occupation of Yugoslavia, one of the most important things for the Axis was to guard the Danube Bank and make this waterway secure for German shipping. At that moment, oil supply of Germany war, uh, war machinery was, uh, possible, uh, was possible almost ex exclusively from Romania. Almost 80% of oil supplying from Romania was carried through the Danube. Because of that reason, the Yugoslav banks of the Danube were very carefully guarded. The German garrisons were deployed even in small Danube settlements such as Veliko Gradište, Golubac, Dobri, and Donje Milanovac. German boats also often patrolled along the Serbian part of the Danube. Although there were uh, numerous- uh, I'm afraid uh, your talk time is coming to the end. You have three no, minutes. No, I have, I have three minutes more, according to my time schedule. 20 minutes, you said. Yugoslav resistance movement members, the German occupation forces managed to hold Iron Gates area safely in their hands until the beginning of September 1944. During the Allied bombing of Yugoslavia from April to September 1944, some towns on the Danube as well as the German transports carrying oil were bombed. In that period, Belgrade was bombed 11 times, Zemun four times, Novi Sad three times, and Smederevo two times. During this campaign, the Allies managed to damage two bridges on the Sava and Danube rivers in Belgrade. German forces were finally pushed off from the lower Danube thanks to an unstoppable advance of Red Army along the river at the end of the August and the beginning of September 1944. This advance shifted Romania and Bulgaria to the side of the anti-fascist coalition and brought the Allied troops on Yugoslav borders. From then on, the Danube on the Yugoslav soil played again the role of strategic barrier in favor of Germans. Joint operation of Red Army's third Ukrainian front units and Yugoslav National Liberation Army that started on September 21st 
road to liberation of the Yugoslav capital city Belgrade on October 20, 1944. Furthermore, the biggest battle that occurred during the Second World War in Yugoslavia, fought by the Red Army and Yugoslav People's Liberation Army, took place at the village of Batina in Baranja, on the right bank of the Danube from 11 to 29 November 1944. After this battle, the whole Danube's waterway on Yugoslav territory was free of German troops. The only force that operated on Yugoslav part of the river a Soviet Danubian flotilla. After the war had ended, the Danube again obtained its role of the first class international communication line of great importance for the economy of the social Yugoslavia. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So, I mean, I just warned you that you had three minutes left, which you exactly actually kept in the end. But this was just a preliminary warning. Uh, I see Lajos's hand being raised, so. Yeah, I have a question uh, slightly connected with the topic of the presentation, but uh, connect. Um, I would like to ask uh, if you can uh, uh, tell example how internationalized the people living on on the on the coast of uh, of uh, Danube uh, that is the international connection because uh, I I, I uh, associated because I remember the opening scene of uh, a famous movie of uh, Kusturica, Black Cat and White Cat. Uh, if you remember that uh, the main actor would like to buy a washing machine from Russian soldiers. Probably you know the scene. Yes. Therefore, my question is uh, how international, officially and unofficially, the, the population living on the coast on here to the Danube River. You can tell example about it, internationalization. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that's of course always an interesting question. Uh, the uh, uh, waterways, as the other kind of ways, are connecting people. Uh, there is a lot of uh, ports full of the sailors of different nationalities. They are doing uh, different things there. And of course, they are making uh, friendships, they are making uh, fights, they are uh, uh, drinking, they are doing some bad things, but they are knowing if each other. So uh, communication way is always good way to know each other, I think. And of course, um, I think we can agree that uh, uh, Middle Europe and the nations around the Danube are very close. We know each other and we very closely making our friendships. Thanks a lot. Um, if I may have a very, very brief question. At the beginning, you mentioned that, that Serbia had to choose a new trading partner um, against the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. And I'm wondering, at what cost actually they found these new connections. So you mentioned that Regensburg became the, the chief trading partner, which makes sense. On the other hand, it makes it it's clear that you had to pass the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. So it had a certain price. <clears throat> um, at what cost actually did, did this new independence from the monarchy unfold? Okay. <clears throat> May I? Okay. Uh, there was no great problems because most of the Serbian goods were actually re-exported from the monarchy towards Germany be before that period. And the Danube was international uh, waterway. So uh, when you have some problems regarding the custom war with the Austria, you do not have problems to carry your goods through the Danube to Regensburg. So uh, for the first year, uh, Serbia didn't have uh, any, uh, any problems regarding its uh, financials uh, in that period. And next year's and uh, uh, next five, uh, several years, the Serbian export value uh, grew for uh, three times on a period. Uh, that uh, on, on, on the period when we were in uh, under the Austrian, uh, how to say, uh, control. And that uh, also Serbia got the opportunity uh, to develop the industry. 
So the number, for example, of uh, industrial workers grew up from 1,700 to 30,000 in uh, less than uh, five or six years. So it was a full independence, I can say. Thank you. Um, and uh, I think it's time to move on now to our last presentation uh, in this first half of the afternoon. So Mila, if you may introduce our last speaker, I'd be grateful. Yeah, thank you. And our next uh, speaker is also from Serbian. Uh, it's Milan Gulic, uh, Institute of Contemporary History, and uh, his report, The Damage Suffered by the Danube Bridges in uh, Yugoslavia During the 20th Century. Please, Milan. Hi, everyone. Do you hear me? We do. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's my uh, really honor to participate in this roundtable and thanks to Institute of Slavic Studies for the invitation. Um, as Mila said, uh, the, my topic is uh, a story about Yugoslav bridges during the wars in uh, 20th century. So we can start because the time is uh, ticking. Uh, for decades, the Danube represented the border between two great states, uh, the Habsburg monarchy and the Ottoman Empire, separating the Orient from Central Europe. After two uprisings at the beginning of the 19th century, the autonomous Pr principality of Serbia was formed on the banks of the Danube within the Ottoman Empire. Serbia gradually strengthened, expanded and built its institutions and overall progress was crowned at the Berlin Congress in, 19, in 1878, when it was recognized as in, an independent state. From 1878 to 1918, the Danube was part of the border between the Austro-Hungarian monarchy and the Kingdom of Serbia. During that time, the borderline on the, on the Danube was not exceeded by the construction of the Annie Bridge. At the end of the First World War, the Austro-Hungarian Empire collapsed and the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes was created. The Yugoslav state encompassed a significant and perhaps the most important part of the course of the Danube. On its ground, the Danube received the most important tributaries and in its hands was the Sip Channel, which was the key for navigation through the Iron Gate sector of the Danube. The Yugoslav state inherited three Austro-Hungarian bridges over the Danube. Two were permanent and one temporary. A 261 meter long temporary road pedestrian bridge across the Danube was built between Novi Sad and Petrovaradin for war purposes in 1915. It was colloquially named the Potjerek Bridge after the Austro-Hungarian general Oskar Potjerek who led the Balkan campaign in 1914. It was used by Austro-Hungarian troops until the end of the war and then by the Yugoslav army and the state until it crashed into the river on February 18th, 1924. It collapsed after he was hit by an iceberg 250 meters long, 80 meters wide and about six meters thick. Crossing the Potjerek Bridge, the victorious Serbian army marched into the Novi Sad on November 9, 1918. In addition, the Yugoslav state inherited two more Austro-Hungarian bridges, the Franz Josef Railway, Railway Bridge from 1883, which connected Novi Sad and Petrovaradin, and the Road Railway Bridge between Erdut and Bogojevo from uh, uh, 19, uh, 1911. The Yugoslav Kingdom built two bridges over the Danube between the two world wars. One connected Novi Sad and Petrovaradin, a bridge of Prince Tomislav, and the other Belgrade uh, and Panchevo, bridge of King Peter II. Uh, are someone trying to say something? I hear something. <laughs> Okay, can I continue? Okay, thank you. 
the road pedestrian bridge of Prince Tomislav was completed after nine years of construction on May 20, uh, 1928, according to the project of Silar Zielinski, and it was named after the second son of the Yugoslav King Alexander Karadjordjevic, who was born a few months earlier. It was 341 meters long bridge, which became a symbol of Novi Sad. The road railway bridge of King Peter II was built in 1935 in the length of 1,516 meters. Both bridges were of great importance for the Yugoslav state as they established a permanent road connection between Bačka and Sirmium and Vanat and Belgrade. The first great suffering of Yugoslav bridges over the Danube was brought by the Second World War. The Kingdom of Yugoslavia was out of the war from September 1939 to April 1941, after the government that signed Yugoslavia's succession to the Triple Alliance was overthrown in coup on uh, March 27, 1941, German and Italian troops were launched at dawn uh, on April 6. Yugoslavia was attacked with such force that three uh, that there was not, mu uh, not uh, much hope for defense. The northern parts of the country, mostly flat, were quickly occupied. In order to stop the penetration of German troops to some extent, the Yugoslav army destroyed the bridges over the Danube. The bridge of Prince Andrei from uh, former bridge of Franz Josef and the bridge of Prince Tomislav uh, near Novi Sad, as well the bridge of King Peter II near Belgrade. Uh, later I will show some uh, pictures if I succeed that. The Novi Sad bridges were destroyed a few minutes before midnight on April 11th. The explosive was planted by members of the 7th Infantry Regiment King Peter I. The order to demolish the bridges was issued by Captain uh, Svetozar Popov. The bridge between Pantrel and Belgrade was destroyed shortly after midnight as the last Yugoslav soldiers crossed from Banat. In order to facilitate transport across the Danube, the German occupation authorities built a railway bridge between Novi Sad and Petrovaradin in 1942 on the pillars of the former bridge of Prince Andrei and rebuilt the badly damaged, damaged bridge of King Peter II between Belgrade and Pančevo. The war bridge in Novi Sad was not in, intended to, uh, for the movement of pedestrians or cars. He served only the German armed forces and movement near bridge near the bridge or uh, its photography was not allowed. Although the Allied Air Force tried to destroy it, it was destroyed only during the withdrawal of uh, German troops from Novi Sad in the afternoon of October 22nd, 1944. The pillars of that bridge still emerge from the Danube as a memorial to the turbulent history of Danube bridges. Allied aviation was more precise in shooting at the Danube Bridge near Belgrade, so it was disabled for any significant transport. However, more damage was done to him by German troops in the retreat. At the end of the Second World War, there was not any single bridge over the Danube in Yugoslavia. In order to establish traffic across that river, uh, new ones were built using pillars or parts of the construction of demolished bridges. First, on the place where the bridge of Prince Tomislav uh, between Novi Sad and, and Petrovaradin used to be, on January 20, 1946, the uh, 345 meter long road railway bridge of Marshal Tito was built. This bridge is considered to be the first permanent Danube bridge, which was built after the Second World War. On November 29th of the same year, the bridge of the Red Army was built on the site of the bridge of King Peter II near Belgrade. The opening of both bridges was attended by the Marshal of Yugoslavia, Josip Broz Tito, and German prisoners of war also took a part in their reconstruction. On August 24, 1947, the reconstruction of the railway bridge between Bogojevo and Derdut was completed. The bridge was uh, 620 meters long. 
Later, Socialist Yugoslavia built nine new bridges over the Danube. The bridge of brotherhood and unity was built in 1961 between Novi Sad and Petrovaradin. It was 466 meters long and was colloquially called Zezel's Bridge after the chief constructor uh, academician Branko Zezel. With the completion of the construction of the Iron Gates hydropower and navigation system in 1972, a road crossing over the dam was realized, which connected Yugoslavia and Romania. During 1974, Yugoslavia gained three new bridges over the Danube. The bridge of May 25 uh, between Bačka Palanka and Ilok was opened by lifelong Yugoslav president Josip Broz Tito in presence of about 70,000 uh, uh, citizens. The road bridge between Bezdan and Batina was 636 meters long. The bridge for the oil and ga gas pipeline between Smederevo and Kovin was 866 meters long. As part of the first phase of construction of the highway between Belgrade and Novi Sad in 1975, a bridge was opened between Beška and Kovil. The 2,250 meter long bridge was designed by academician Branko Zezel. In 1976, a 1,424 meter long road bridge was opened between Kovin and Smederevo. Apart from the railway, Bogojevo and Erdut have been con connected since 1980 by a road bridge which was 668 meters long. The road bridge uh, of October 23rd was built in 1981 between Novi Sad and Sremska Kamenica. It was designed by academician Nikola Haydin, and it was the longest bridge in the waters around Novi Sad within uh, 1,320 and uh, 12 meters. The second suffering of the Yugoslav bridges over the Danube happened during the aggression of NATO pact. The intervention of the military alliance of 19 states took place on March 23rd, 1999, after unsuccessful negotiations between the Yugoslav and Serbian authorities and the representatives of the Albanian minority in the autonomous province of Kosovo and Metohija. During the aggression, which lasted 78 days, factories, residential buildings, schools, hospitals, but also bridges were damaged. According to the official data from the Yugoslav authorities, 82 bridges were destroyed or damaged, including, including extremely important bridges across the Danube. Yugoslavia welcomed the war in 1999 with 11 Danube bridges, of which seven were destroyed or disabled. The Varadin Bridge in Novi Sad, until 1999, Bridge of Marshal Tito, was hit directly at dawn on April the 1st, 1999. The entire stru structure fell into the river, ending its 53-year history. One young man who was found on the bridge was killed during the demolition. The Bridge of Freedom, formerly the Bridge of October 23rd, was hit by bombers on April 3rd in the evening. It was interrupted in two places and completely disabled for traffic for a longer period of time. At the time of the rocketing, there were several cars and pedestrians, uh, pedestrians on the bridge. There were no casualties, seven people were injured and an important role in rescuing people was played by a local fisherman who was found not far away from the bridge. Zezer's bridge, until 1999, the bridge of brotherhood and unity, was rocketed for the first time on April 5th. Its strong construction was not significantly damaged, so the road traffic across the bridge was soon restored. Zezer's bridge was bombed again on April 21st, 22nd and 24th, and each time at, this, at a similar time, between two and three o'clock in the morning. Finally, it was shut down during the fifth strike of NATO avi aviation on April 26 at 1 and 20 uh, 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 a.m. and sent into history after 38 
years of use. In addition to the three bridges in Novi Sad, four other bridges over the Danube were targeted by NATO bombers. The road bridge between Bačka Palanka and Dilok, which connected Yugoslavia and Croatia, was rocketed twice. He was not significantly damaged in the first strike on April 4th. The second blow from April 19th was more devastating. The bridge was not destroyed, but it is disabled for traffic. The second bridge that connected Yugoslavia and Croatia between Bogojevo and Erdut was severely damaged during the NATO's airstrike on April 5th. The road bridge between Kovin and Smederevo was hit and disabled in a single strike on April 15th. The road bridge between Beška and Kovil, which was one of the longest bridges in Europe, was also rocketed twice. He was first targeted on April 21st and the second time on April 28th, when he was disabled for traffic. Based on the above, uh, above we see that NATO strikes uh, on Yugoslav bridges were carried out in the first month of Operation Allied Force. After these strikes, Yugoslavia remained at only four crossings over the Danube, with only one bridge over the Danube between the bridge connecting uh, Bezdan and Vatina on the border of Yugoslavia, Hungary and Croatia, and crossing over Iron Gates. It was bridge between Belgrade and Pančevo. However, bridges also testify that life always beats death. By the end of the 20th century, Yugoslavia had managed to bridge the Danube beyond the four remaining crossings. The bridge between Beška and Kovil was rebuilt shortly after the end of the airstrikes on July 20, 1999. On May 29, 2000, uh, Novi Sad received a temporary assembly, disassemble, uh, disassembly uh, road railway bridge. It was soon named after Boško Perošević, the president of the Executive Council of the Autonom Autonomous Province of Vojvodina, who was killed a few days before the opening ceremony. The bridge was used for a full 20 years and was dismantled in 2019. In addition, on the site of the former Varadin and the bridge of Prince Tomislav, on October 19, 2000, the Varadin Skaduga bridge was opened, which still exists today. In the following years, other bridges over the Danube were rebuilt, connecting the two banks, areas, or states. At the same time, the last variant of the Yugoslav state disappeared, and two of its former republics remained on the banks of the Danube, Croatia and Serbia. After all demolition and reconstruction, on that part of the Danube, today there are 15 bridges and the real need to build more new ones, especially around Belgrade. Uh, now I, I will try uh, to show a few pictures, but I'm not quite sure that I will uh, succeed in that. Just a moment. You have uh, two minutes left, by the way. That's quite enough. Just a moment. Uh, I'm... <laughs> Just a moment. I'm not quite good is this in this. So at the bottom of the page you have a this share screen which is marked in uh, green and that's how you can share any ah, share screen. Okay. Steps. Uh There. Oh, so uh, this is uh, Potyorek Bridge in Novi Sad, uh, built during the First World War. Uh, this is a Franz Joseph uh, Bridge in Novi Sad, uh, after named the Bridge of uh, Prince Andrei, uh, crushed in, uh, at the beginning of the Second World War. This is the same bridge. So this is uh, the bridge between Novi Sad and Petrovaradin. Same bridge again. Uh, this is uh, a bridge between uh, Erdut and Bogojevo. 
Uh, this is a bridge of Prince Tomislav built in Novi Sad, uh, crushed at the beginning of the Second World War. Uh, this is a bridge over the Danube uh, near Belgrade. Uh, it's a bridge of King Peter II. Uh, nowadays, uh, we call that bridge uh, a Panchevo bridge. Uh, again, the same bridge. The ceremony of opening of bridge of the uh, King Peter II. Uh, this is a, a bridge of Prince Tomislav in Novi Sad at the beginning of at the beginning of Second World War. Can you see all the things? Yes, we do. Okay. Um, this is a bridge of Marshal Tito in Novi Sad. This is a Zhezhel's bridge in Novi Sad. Uh, this is the former bridge of Marshal Tito after NATO bombing. Uh, just a short movie, few seconds. So it's the same. Varadin Bridge or Bridge of Marshal Tito. It's a day after NATO hit that bridge. As you can see, it's completely ruined. That's enough. Um, uh, this is an airstrike to Zhezhel's bridge in Novi Sad. I'm not quite sure, is it first, second, third, or fourth strike? Maybe the first or second. This is a Zhezhel's bridge after two strikes, I think. Uh, this is a Zhezhel's bridge after three strikes, I think. Uh, this is a bridge between uh, Kovin and Smederevo. The same bridge. And this is a former bridge of uh, Boško Perošević. So, that's all. That's all. And uh, stop share. Okay. Thank you, it's worked. And uh, now the Thank you for your for your attention. Thank you very much. You. And now it's time for questions. Vajosh. Yeah, I don't want to be the official question, but uh, uh, I have a question. Partly I am geographer. Therefore, I uh, listen to your presentation as uh, uh, the point of view of, uh, of traffic geography. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, construct not enough uh, uh, bridges uh, between the cost of the river, therefore, uh, uh, therefore uh, the frequency of the ferry uh, may indicate the, uh, the uh, efficiency of the bridge service. My question, uh, uh, how many ferries function uh, recently or, or former time uh, on the uh, Serbian section of, uh, of Danube? I, I I didn't hear you. Can, can you can you repeat the question? I didn't hear you. Just a moment. Concern the ferries, ferries, alternative communication devices between the uh, coast of the river, because it, in the case of Hungary, for example, uh, in the Tisza River, not the Danube, but the Tisza River, not enough uh, constructed, not enough bridges. Therefore, very high the frequency of the ferries. The ferries is cheaper and serve a popular uh, need and, and, and the flexibly uh, increase and decrease the frequency of the ferry. During, for example, summertime, they activate a lot of uh, new ferries during the winter time, only one, two, three. Therefore, the ferries indicate very well the efficiency of the bridges efficiency of the bridges service. Therefore, my question concerns the frequency number and the, the alternative function of mm -hmm. the ferry. I don't have numbers in my hand now, but I understand your question. Uh, the frequency of transport nowadays in Serbia, it's uh, not like uh, uh, in uh, for, uh, former days during the socialist Yugoslavia or, or, or during the kingdom of Yugoslavia. 
Um, so the main transport uh, was uh, 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 was uh, through uh, Serbian uh, 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 waterways, not uh, inside of Serbia. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of need uh, for a new bridges, uh, as I said, especially uh, around Belgrade and uh, between the other areas, um, um, especially from Belgrade to the Iron Gates. Uh, so the, uh, in this time, uh, we can say that uh, uh, water transport in Serbia is not uh, used um, uh, as, as used to be and uh, uh, as um, uh, need to be. Uh, so uh, this is a time uh, uh, different from the past and uh, I don't know uh, in which way uh, everything this led. Okay, thanks. Um, if I may have a very brief comment, uh, you mentioned at the end of, uh, of the Second World War that, uh, that the Tomislav Bridge was rebuilt quite rapidly or the bridge between Novi Sad and uh, mm -hmm. Petrovaradin and it, that it opened on uh, 20th of January and yes. um, Hungary is very proud to have rebuilt um, a, or built a bridge uh, in Budapest called Kossuth Bridge right at the end of the Second World War, which was opened on the 15th of January in 1946, which was a half permanent. Five days earlier, five days earlier. Uh, yeah, so this is probably, I, I, I'm just wondering how much it was national pride to be faster uh, than, than what's happening uh, on the other side of the border. I can imagine that they were quite trying to speed up the process. It was not a permanent bridge, or I mean, at least it lasted for 10 years, uh, by which they built a number of other bridges in the territory of present-day Budapest. Nonetheless, it's interesting from the perspective that that it probably this is the time frame with which one could rebuild the bridge after the, the destructions of the war. So it's it's an interesting comparative material that that is there. Um, in the matter of fact, this bridge uh, um, was finished at uh, uh, 30, uh, 31st December 1945, but the ceremony was at 20th January, so we count the time of ceremony. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I see uh, the hand of Branko Steimer. Yes. I would I would have one small question, more than a comment to, to Milan, and uh, regarding uh, this question of colleague Lars Ratz. I think that he was uh, understanding, are there any skelas, what we call in Croatia and Serbia, are there skelas or, uh, or kompa, skela in, in, on the Danube River, especially around uh, Belgrade, which could su supplement the non-existence of, of the bridges? Nowadays, no. No, there is no, no, no. Because no. I know, right, let's say, I, for example, I was in Hungary and uh, I traveled from Budapest to Visegrad, and I went across the Danube by by this ferry, by this scala. Of, and I think uh, that this was uh, 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 last uh, uh, last use of scala was in Novi Sad, after that uh, all three bridges was 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 mm -hmm. crashed, and uh, that is for just for a few months. For few months uh, okay. before the first bridge was uh, 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 finished, and, uh, now, and um, except that. Uh, uh, there are a few skills after Second World War, but nowadays uh, there, there, there isn't any any scale I answer. And no, and no fast uh, track track life, uh, ship lines and nothing. Nothing, nothing. During the socialist Yugoslavia was a, 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 a fast line from Belgrade to Iron Gates to Kladovo, and mm -hmm. uh, I think that from uh, 1980 uh, that that line. Uh, well, or, or doesn't exist anymore. Okay. Yeah, but only one comment uh, for the question of the ferry. For example, in the case of in, of Hung in Hungary, uh, one of the uh, form of uh, private investment uh, mm -hmm. are making a ferry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very inter very interesting. Local people who, uh, for example, stands that very far uh, are, are uh, bridge. Therefore. Uh, much better to invest to the ferry because they save uh, money uh, from fuel uh, expenses and uh, and very interesting. Uh, it's a local uh, investment, local private investment indicator of the ferry. Uh, 
increase the number of tariffs, decrease, and there is a uh, conjuncture of, of that. It's very interesting topic. Uh, one of my friends uh, specialized to analyzing how appear the idea, investment, and uh, and there is a, uh, for example, a very one indicator of the dark economy and the gray and the dark economy somehow because no bill, <laughs> no receipt, <laughs> only uh, 100 uh, percent income for the owner. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and before I give the word to Marco Kudic, uh, let me just mention that now the floor is open for to, to discuss any of the papers that we heard. So uh, not only Milan, but the other three presenters could also be asked. Uh, I give the word to Marco right now. Uh, uh, you're muted, so we cannot hear you at the moment. No, now now I'm unmuted. I, I've just uh, it was really interesting to hear, and I'm sorry that I I, I I was late because of my faculty things here in in Belgrade in Nandor Fehervar as as it, as in Hungary, with old old time Hungary they would say. Uh, I have just one interesting thing to to say because uh, maybe maybe Milan knows knows this. Uh, it's it's not on uh, it's not on. This it not not on Danube, but it's on Tisa that this ferry, this scala, was uh, used to be. There used to be a scala between two uh, small villages or a little a little town and a small village in Bačka and Banat, but they they just quit it. So there is no scala now between Jabal and and uh, what is the the Tarash. So uh, the peasants from who who have who have. Um, uh, who have fields on the other side of the Tissa have to go uh, totally around, have to go like 50 kilometers every day. So that, that is just, just an appendix to, to, to what, to what uh, uh, Milan said. Thank, thank you, Marco. Thank, thank you, Marco. You, uh, you helped me uh, 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 and uh, you refresh my memory. There is one scala on the Danube in Serbia. Huh? Uh, there is one scala, so uh, uh, it's it's a scala between Ram and Stara Palanka. Um, it is a connection between Banat and the other part of Serbia near Romanian border. So th there is one. <laughs> there is one. <laughs> All right. Okay. So now the floor is open for questions. You can raise your hand or directly even type the question. I Are see like. Laios. Sorry, uh, I have a, a, a question for each uh, presenter of uh, this section or for everybody. In the Hungarian history, as I mentioned in my presentation, very important uh, the metaphor that the Danube, it is the boundary of civilization and the uh, and, uh, important deed crossing on the Danube. Uh, like uh, uh, Hungarian poet Adi wrote that this is a uh, ferry count, country which moving from east to west and back. Therefore, my question, in other uh, society, community, uh, uh, like uh, playing so high importance connected to the civilization or not, I'm interested for. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone Edith, has a... Uh, Edith wants to say something. You're Microphone. muted, Edith. We come from the same culture, but uh, I, I read a lot about this and there is a uh, this imagination of this ante morale that is something that goes through the whole region. I mean, you find it uh, for Croatia, for Serbia, with different accents, of course. I wouldn't say it's exactly the same, but it's uh, it's very similar to this fairy uh, story of the Hungarians. But I would also say that Odi doesn't how to say, he problematizes this concept of a ferry. He says, we thought that we were building a bridge and instead of a bridge, we are a country or a ferry country torn apart between East and West. That is, that is what he's saying. And he's very critical of this situation. I mean, 
I don't know, maybe we can, if, if we are asking that question, we can ask if other nations problematize also this question of being somewhere on the borders or at the boundaries uh, of East and West, which is quite common as far as I know for these cultures. Um, if I may intervene, uh, there is a great blue book by Paul Shrodetsky, who is teaching at Kiel University, entitled Dante Murale Christianitatis, and he shows that this topo is present from Poland to Croatia, connected actually to noble families, to, to different ethnic groups who are guarding the frontiers, and this is something which has been passed on and on. Uh, so this is not specific at all, um, actually, to Hungary, but um, indeed is something which has been problematized all over Europe and which was a, actually a way to uh, show the importance of, of different groups and also to uh, raise money actually uh, for war, um, which was also present. Um, if I may have a question to, um, as well, uh, I really love the, uh, the presentation on, on the, the Danube Delta. And what I was wondering is, um, is the, the actual, actual collision of different interests. So uh, obviously some were interested in, uh, in, um, in trading possibilities, but this was, as far as I know, a very important area for fishing, especially for sturgeon fishing, which was uh, of course something which was very much hindered by, by traffic of ships and how actually they how much actually in the 19th century this, this, these different economic interests were expressed in any kind of regulation works or um, simply um, trading was more important than anything else at that moment or how was it treated in the mid 19th century? Yes, thank you uh, for the question. I mean, you basically answered it. I mean, during after the Crimean War, uh, uh, traffic and, and, and by that I mean uh, export of grains from uh, the principalities to everywhere in the world was, was dominant. So ev everything else uh, was, was second rate, let's, let's say so. Uh, towards the end of the 19th century, uh, fishing starts to, to play a role. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's not that it's never been there, but uh, but it somehow uh, uh, comes to the, comes to the fore and and uh, it's it's also a new law a, a Romanian law uh, that protects uh, fishing so it's 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 somehow uh, the, the engineering constructions were uh, obstructing uh, the fishing grounds but also the traps of the the fishermen were you know uh, uh, causing problems to the ships. So, uh, uh, you know, at the turn of the century, only the Romanian state tried to mitigate, but the uh, European uh, uh, Commission, who stayed there even un until the Second World War, uh, its main interest uh, was, was navigation, this freedom of navigation. So, uh, uh, seen from this uh, protocols of the Commission, that was the, the, the goal to achieve and everything else was, was secondary. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe uh, just a very short question, maybe first to Milan, or it is inspired by his presentation, but if others can um, comment on that, I would be also glad. Uh, it concerns the naming of the bridges, uh, because in your presentation, uh, we may hear that some bridges were named after historical figures, others after historical um, events or dates. Um, in the past or now, is there any public debate on this naming? Uh, are there any clashes between different parties uh, preferring to give one or another name or to highlight one or another figure or event? Or is it a um, very uh, calm issue which is decided by central or local authorities without any uh, response from the public? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, but th th there wasn't a debate uh, uh, in the past uh, because during the Yugoslav kingdom, uh, it was the time of monarchy. So uh, no one uh, can say anything against the names uh, as King Peter II or Prince Tomislav or Prince Andrei. So 
there, there is any debate about that. Uh, after Second World War, um, there is uh, again a, 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 specific, a specific kind of uh, society. It's communist society, um, uh, and uh, anyone cannot say anything against the names uh, a bridge of Marshal Tito or the dates of liberation of some uh, uh, parts of Yugoslavia or cities. Um, nowadays, um, uh, the bridges in Serbia mostly, uh, mostly not only on Danube, not only on Danube, uh, don't have any kind of name uh, because uh, during the debates uh, uh, we cannot uh, make any uh, any consensus. So uh, now we just have a colloquial names as Panchevo Bridge or something like that. But but there is an exception. Um, uh, the last uh, uh, um, uh, built bridge on Danube in Serbia uh, was named uh, 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 Mihailo Pupin, uh, famous uh, Serbian and world uh, uh, scientist. So uh, it was. But there is uh, there is uh, uh, the um, colloquial name of that bridge. So the. Uh, former name was uh, uh, is uh, Mihailo Pupin or Pupin's Bridge, and the colloquial name is Chinese Bridge, uh, because the Chinese uh, 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 Chinese uh, companies uh, uh, built um, that bridge between uh, two parts of Belgrade. So uh, when you say uh, Pupin's Bridge, uh, uh, um, just a few people will know what is that. What, what is that? But, but when you say a Chinese bridge, everyone will know. Okay. So, the, so there is, uh, there is, uh, uh, there, there was any rule uh, during time uh, to name some bridges. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think our time is up for the first uh, half. If there is any last question, perhaps. Uh... May I? Oh, you uh, may. <laughs> I have a question to Serbian co colleagues. Uh, did the Danube uh, perceived as a real border between the Serbs of the Vojvodina and uh, the kingdom of the uh, Serbian kingdom uh, after their uh, unification in Yugoslavia? Then all right. <laughs> Maybe then, maybe then. Mm -hmm. Well, at the beginning, probably yes, but you know, uh, especially in the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, the process of unification is slow, go slow going process. You need at least 30 years for a full unification and one generation to be born and raised in the country to fill this country as its own territory. Uh, uh, and home country. Uh, so uh, it, it can be a problem uh, in the period between First and Second World War, but after the Second World War, problems anymore regarding the borders and the, regarding the, the Danube and Sava as a borders between the civilization. As a nation, we are across those borders. <laughs> He, uh, he, during the 17th century, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Shall we close then the first half of this afternoon? Yes, I'd like to thank you all who uh, were listening and putting questions. And first of all, of course, our uh, speakers uh, who gave us uh, very inspiring papers, which are so diverse in their um, methodology and uh, topic they uh, suggested uh, to be discussed. Uh, let us make some 25, 30 minutes uh, break. Uh, I'll switch it on again at 7.30, but uh, let us give some five minutes for uh, slow switching on and probably we will uh, start start again in 1735 uh, and please uh, 
have good rest and come refreshed and with new ideas to listen to our second part. I very much expect you all uh, in a half an hour. Thank you once again and uh, see you very soon.